हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द हिंदू एडिटोरियल डिस्कशन टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस ऑन द न्यूज़पेपर ऑफ नवंबर फिफ्थ 2020 माय नेम इज रायन पिंटो टुडे टॉपिक फॉर डिस्कशन इज इंडियन इकोनॉमी इलेक्शन रिफॉर्म्स एंड कमीशन फेडरलिज्म लैंग्वेज एंड फेडरलिज्म सो व्हाट आर वी गोइंग टू डिस्कस टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट some changes that needs to be done in indian economy considering the covid 19 and the investment situations etc second topic we are going to see is election reforms and the role of election commission model code of conduct all these points we are going to see third topic is on federalism we are going to see center state relation focusing on gst and financial matters and the last point is language and federalism focusing on regionalism and karnataka state of karnataka so let's go ahead with the topic so when we talk about industrial revolution it started in the 1750s there was four phases of industrial revolution it is first phase was mechanization which was helped by steam power water power etc second phase was mass production assembly line electricity third was in the 1970s that is computer and automation and the fourth was is recently we are in the fourth industrial revolution cyber physical system so you have to just remember these four phases mechanization mass production computer and the fourth phase which we are going through now so what are we talking today what are the uh, why are we discussing this evolution and why are we focusing on now when we talk about making jobs or creating jobs the first thing that we must know is industrial or industries are the region or are is the section or that part of the society which creates a lot of job but problem in industries in india is we have not been able to pull investments we are not been we have not been able to grow in the industrial sector we directly jumped from agricultural sector to the services sector which has hurt the economy what are the changes that we need how can we how can we attract more investors that is what we must be able to think today or we are going to discuss now fixing the rules of the economy the fundamentals of the game have to change as they currently favor wealthy investors and not workers and tiny enterprises you must have noticed uh, even in the economic outlook or in the world economic forum the reports have shown that in india few people are very rich and the gdp is mostly owned by them 1% of the top indians own the gdp uh, uh, that is around 73% of gdp so these are the numbers you should keep in mind lot of inequality unemployment rates are one of the highest recently so keeping these things in pro- in in mind we need to fix some rules of economy so you might be thinking people might be thinking what are the steps which we can take so this editorial is a beautiful editorial on what steps we need to take so that we can improve our economy it will help you in answering your upsc questions india has a income crisis incomes of people in in the lower part of the pyramid are too low so you must remember the income crisis are uh, are felt by a country the per capita income you have seen recently we are we are very we are below uh, bangladesh we have reached below bangladesh bangladesh is dollar 1888 we are dollar 1877 do uh, there are other factors like population but we are in a income crisis our top peer, the position people those who are very rich they earn a lot whereas those who are uh, in the bottom half that's uh, in the bottom uh, most lowest section antyodya they are not earning much what are the solutions so we have seen the problems we have seen what are the what is the statistics the next thing that should come to your mind is what is the solution to uh, improve the situation so first is free up the markets second is improve productivity and third is apply technology so when you write your answers these are the solutions that you can give free up markets improve productivity 
and apply technology not only for the answers it's if you have to question if you have to question the government on how can we improve the economy you must give these three points that's that is free up markets improve productivity and third is apply, apply technology so let's see these solutions number 1 free up markets economists say markets should be freed up for agricultural products so that farmers can get higher prices this is what recently the government has been trying to do by bringing the farm bills but the problem is these things were there earlier also did it affect the farmers income that is a question mark and that is why the question of msp has again and again come up recently farmers in haryana and punjab are fighting against uh, the steps taken by the government because they do not trust the government msp is needed that is what they say so first point is free up the markets i gave you the positives as well as the negatives this will also help in uh, attracting investment second in the same <coughs> free up the markets the second labor second is labor to attract investment it is inadequate growth of incomes that has caused a slump in investment the purpose of freeing up markets for labor is to reduce the burden of wages so just remember so uh, so if you, the the reason why uh, labor is needed is so that the freeing up of the labor is needed so that to reduce the burden of wage cost on investors what happens is if you keep a a minimum and a compulsory amount of wages to be given then investors find it difficult they want so you must understand investors want as much as profits as possible and when rules are kept that you have to pay the laborer so much then they are skeptical they don't enter such markets so freeing up the labor is this is one of the objective but will it help in increasing the productivity will it help in giving human rights that's another question human rights must prevail over economic con- consideration this is what the writer has to say good markets enable smooth transaction so the ra- writer is saying then we need to have a balance between freeing up the market as well as human rights so this is about freeing up the markets so we saw the agricultural point of view we saw the labor point of view positive negative decision then needs to be taken by the people in command <coughs> second is improvement of productivity so second way of uh, increasing the economy is productivity increase of the productivity what is productivity it is a ratio of an input in the denominator and an output in the numerator it means how much you put in input and what you get in return that is productivity so the larger the output that is produced with a unit of input the higher the productivity so if you are able to get more things by putting less things that's better productivity and uh, we need to focus on increasing our productivity companies can apply two broad strategies for improving their productivity they can take managerially more difficult route of increasing the output of the so you must remember companies companies can have two broad strategies they can they can take the more difficult managerial route okay or what they can do is they can give more skills and all to the laborers and get in the more uh, more productivity from the so managerial route is by giving them incentives or by giving them punishments giving the workers punishments incentives etc this may require adding more machines and technology to supplement the capacity of workers to increase total output this is a good strategy so managerial route also includes giving more investments putting more capital rich enterprises bringing more technology on the other hand employers can enhance the workers skills as i have told you workers skills can be enhanced create a culture of continuous improvement in the factory whereby workers and managers cooperate to improve the capability of their system so so till now we are seeing two things first is the managerial route and in second one we are seeing improving the workers skills this is a strategy of total quality management with which japanese companies reduce their costs so just imagine 
Japan Japan today is considered to be one of the best in in technology and in industries so they were able to use this total quality management route by increasing the productivity so first we saw freeing up the markets second we are seeing improving the productivity so remember these points in mind so if you if we want to grow our country this is the strategy we should be following humans are the only appreciating assets in an enterprise so just remember in an enterprise whenever you become an ias officer or if you are heading a company or a manager of a company you should be remembering this that humans are the only appreciating assets what happens is we focus on all the other things we focus on all the factors of production that is land we focus on uh entrepreneur strategies we focus on capital but one thing we always forget is labor human beings human beings develop when they are treated with respect and provided with environments to learn so you must remember human beings develop when they are treated with respect so it is an appreciating asset the lazy management strategy for improving productivity is to reduce the denominator that is reduce the number of workers so so this is how you must remember hire them when times are good and fire them when the company is not able to compete this is how lazy managers work governments of countries cannot apply this hire and fire strategy we need to focus on the human capital because that is the only appreciating asset that we need to have or we have if a country is not productive in terms of gdp per per unit of population it's not possible for the government to fire the citizens where will the citizens go who will take care of them so for capital scarce and human resource abundant countries such as developing countries like india the correct ratio of productivity is output per unit of capital this must be the driver of business as well as national strategy so for us we can't throw off the citizens to increase our gdp to increase our productivity to increase our per capita income what we need to do is focus on the uh, uh quality skills of the citizens so by giving them education and innovation and health etc so the social contract schumacher who is one of an economist best known for his seminal idea small is beautiful and his book with the same title was an economist ahead of time capitalism powered with technology would be heading uh, so he he said small is beautiful so and he also said capital powered with technology would be the future in his essay industrialization through intermediate technology published by journal resurgent in 1966 all this was said by shumaka who was a economist shumaka had warned that there was a malaise brewing beneath the drive to westernize and technology technologize economy so he said industrialization is going to happen with technology and the countries and the companies will start westernizing and technologizing the companies and the countries but there needs to be uh, some uh, we need to be careful about some things the harsh lockdown of the economy in india to prevent the spread of covid-19 caused the malaise to spill out of for everyone to see so we have seen people being removed from their companies we have seen companies closing down one of the reason is these basics were not taken care of a good job implies a contract between workers and society workers provide the economy with product and services it needs in return society and economy must create good working conditions government must regulate contract between those who engage people to do work for their enterprise even in the gig economy gig economy means where the workers are working freelance they are working on a project basis contract basis even in that the government should see to it that the contracts are done properly and the workers are given what they are due because if you continuously go for 
uh, westernization or technologization it can't be that you start removing the workers danny rodrick says too often they that is the government subsidized labor replacing capital intensive technologies rather than pushing innovation in socially more beneficial directions mostly what the governments do push labor replacing capital intensive technology but where will the workers go that is the question that we need to have so in conclusion the power to fix the rules of the game has become concentrated with wealthy investors multinational multinational corporation the rules do not favor the workers and tiny enterprises because they have too little power large enterprise they employ fewer people for getting more profits therefore labor unions have lost their support base small enterprise and workers must combine to form large association using technology to tilt to reforms so what the conclusion you have to give is it's not that technology is bad but also human consideration and thinking about the workers is needed so when this happens the country as a whole will rise because every individual makes a country you can't grow the country just by growing one or two percent of people so this is how your the government needs to think this is how the government needs to take its decision is said by the writer in this editorial the next editorial is federalism in india when we talk about federalism we know india is a federal country with unitary bias we have more powers given to the center but the states are not weak the states are also important this is what is written in our constitution so we have national government and we have state government and we have a balance and who plays a major role in keeping the balance we'll see we are going to talk about is finance commission which is balancing wheel of fiscal federalism so today's point we are talking about is federalism keeping finance in view the financial capacity of the state has been weakened through various means government has substantially reduced currently the government you must have seen has reduced the fiscal capability of the states state governments drive a majority of countries development program so you you must have seen major programs are done by the states great numbers of people depend on these programs for their livelihood development welfare and security you must remember states are very important they take up most of the programs <coughs> now states need resources to carry out these programs unfortunately the financial capacity of the state is being weakened how it is been weakened you will understand the ability of the states to ex- expand its revenue has been weakened since the gst regime was adopted the center res- center's resource mobilization space with respect to the states is now far greater center can take more money remember in the taxes center takes in more money, money through income tax and corporation tax or corporate tax center has systematically cut the share of the states in taxes raised by the union government of devolution so what has happened is center and states we have center taking more of the income or the money or the tax whereas states doing more of the work so it is the duty of the center to give the share in to the states in uh, constitution you will be seeing article 270 where center and states need to share the tax article 270 remember it has reduced the pool of funds to be shared with the states by shifting from taxes to cesses and surcharge in article 271 we talk about cess and surcharge in that it is written that the center can take put cess and surcharge and this money will not go to the state so just remember article 270 center and states need to divide the uh, the taxes and 271 consist of cess and surcharge where the center keeps in all the money recently the center is putting more of cess so that they don't they are not liable to give the money to the to the states and even gst where the center had promised that they are going to compensate the states they have not paid the money to the states now 
who talks about the devolution that's the finance commission so every 5 years we have finance commission appointed by the president and uh, we have the 15th finance commission by n k singh headed by n k singh remember this name he is the chairman of the finance commission 15th finance commission and the work of the finance commission is to uh, to tell the principles on which center and state needs to divide the money how much money center will keep how much money states will keep how much uh, what are the other things that is there whichever things president tells to the finance commission it tells it has to do currently 42% out of the money which center receives 42% should be going to the states but the center is not giving the ex- exact amount to the states so the devolution has kept on declining finance commission recommended the share of states in the taxes raised by the union government prior to 2014 devolution of the funds to the states were consistently and cumulatively more than the 13 finance commission projections the year 2014-15 commenced with a shock actual devolution was 14% less means if the advice is given if the, if the advice is given by the central government that is the finance commission to the state government the actual money is not received that is what you have to remember the devolution was 42% currently you must remember 42% is the devolution but are they getting the exact money answer is no the states got 797549 crore less than what was projected that is 14% less so you must remember these facts and figures shrinking divisible pool how it is shrinking as i gave you in article 271 cess is put more union government can retain the whole amount but the union government keeps more of that revenue and reduces the size of the divisible pool pool as a result the states lose out on their share between 2014 15 1920 cesses and surcharge soared from 9.3% to 15% of the gross tax revenue just imagine 15% was the cess which the union government was getting <coughs> so you must just remember cess and surcharge what is the meaning of cess and what is the meaning of surcharge cess is a tax on tax for a specific purpose surcharge again is a tax on tax but cess is for a per- specific purpose in 2019-20 alone union government expected 369111 crores from cesses and surcharge just imagine the amount union government is getting in one year through cess and that is why it is giving more and more focus on cess because they need not pay to the states so that is one issue gst shortfall is an issue the states are not getting the money compensation have been been paid from gst cess revenue gst cesses are levied on sin goods those goods like cigarettes and luxury and all these luxurious goods are called as sin goods so these taxes are put on these goods so that it can be gave, kept aside for compensating the states for gst till 2021 it had to be done so the this cess will be there even after 2021 that is one point you have to remember secondly this money which was kept this year the finance minister said we don't have enough money to pay to the state government so they are not paying the state government also and they are going to continue with the cesses that is what is the situation that you should remember the union government will not have to pay okay so what you have to remember is the union government will not have to pay a rupee of this as debt or interest because it's a cess the entire loan can be repaid out of the assured cess revenue that will continue to accrue by 2022 so they will not have to pay anything to the central government because of this cess 
the state government. Of the nearly 3 lakh crore GST shortfall to the states, the centre will only compensate 1.8 lakh crore. Central, gov- central grants are also likely to drop significantly from 31,570 crore al- allocated to Karnataka, actual grants may be down to 17,000. So this is just an example where the finance commission devolution is less, GST compensation is less, grants are also less. So just remember these points. Due to the combined effect of the cup, cutbacks in devolution, shrinking divisible pool, failure to pay the full GST, failure to pay the full GST, because of all these things, uh, you must say the states may experience a shortfall of 20 to 25 percent revenue. States are now forced to resource, resort to colossal borrowings. The fall in funds for development and welfare program will adversely impact livelihoods of crores of Indians, per capita income, human resource development and poverty. This is a negative sum game. So this full topic we spoke about how how federalism is important and how centre needs to give more money, finance to the states so that the states can do their work and the federalism can work properly and these things can happen. Election Commission that is Nirvachan Sadan. So we are talk, going to talk about the elections and the election commission. Election commission of India is one of the one of the bulwark of democracy in India. Free and fair elections is very very essential for a democracy. So that is why we say elections and the election commission is very very important. So when we talk about election commission what we have to remember is in in the elections who conducts or which is the body or the organization which conducts the election commission uh, election that's the election commission we are going to talk about the star status what happened in uh, the current situation supreme court's stay on the revocation of status of former madhya pradesh chief minister kamal nath as a star campaigner so we know in madhya pradesh there are by-elections going on and uh, Kamal Nath was a star campaigner and election commission rebuked or removed his uh, status of star campaigner. Supreme Court stayed it. The reason why his uh, status was removed by election commission is because of his uh, statements given against Imarti Devi who is in opposition. Now what we are discussing, discussing over here is uh, is does election have, commission have has any power because uh, supreme court has uh, you know put a stay on this decision by the election commission so our focus is going to be on that section 77 of the representation of people's act 1951 relates to a candidate's election expenditure does leave it to the political party itself to decide who its leaders are and allows every party to submit a list so Section 77 in the Representation People Act says the political party should tell who is uh, w- what is its expenditure and who the leaders will be, who the star campaigner will be. What is the importance of the star campaigner? Star campaigner status comes with a clear privilege. The expenditure incurred on the campaign done from the list of star campaigner is not included in the expenditure of the candidate concerned. So it helps in saving the money and uh, see every candidate or every uh, you can say candidate has to show how much expenditure is done by he or she. But for a star campaigner it is allowed that they need not disclose their, uh, their traveling expenses and all that. So it helps to for the movement using the choppers or the helicopters or etc. So you can save on that expenditure because there is a limit of the expenditure which can be done in the elections. But now Kamal Nath has been, was being said by the election commission to take off the star status from Kamal Nath and the Supreme Court has stayed it for the moment. It stands to reason that ECI that is Election Commission of India in exercise of its general power 
control direction over election ought to have given ha, ought to have the power to revoke the status if there is an apparent breach of model code of conduct so model code of conduct what do you mean by model code of conduct model code of conduct means uh, it's a rules or regulations that every election political party should follow whenever there is elections and if they are not election commission of india can take strict action against them but is it happening the answer is no election of commission of india uh, has a lot of negative points it needs to be given more powers needs to give be given more teeth so that uh, the political parties can behave better and elections can be take done smoothly it is indeed debatable whether the eci has been exercising its powers in an even handed way in recent years however it is equally important that the eci's power to enforce full poll norms and clean campaigns is not unduly abridged so more teeth needs to be given to the election commission of india and it needs to be given more power so that elections can be done fairly we know election commission of india is according to article 324 and its main focus is to have free and clean elections and uh, in case of upsc a lot of questions coming on this topic and you can mention in the current about the star status the next is federalism so we spoke of one area of federalism and uh, finance here we are going to talk about federalism language and karnataka specifically focusing on karnataka so you will get an idea something about karnataka which is going on in karnataka which is going on in bangalore and about the federalism there link it with the federalism is linguistic nationalism on the win earlier we have seen uh, in uh, many states fight for on, on language was going on starting with tamil nadu later on in various areas so it leads to regionalism but is linguistic nationalism declining at this time each year how do we know what is the context at this time each year there is a lot of celebration of rajyotsav in karnataka commemorating the karnataka day on 1st of november 1957 because of the karnataka which was formed in 1956 <coughs> uh, so before that it was mysore then later it was converted into karnataka and uh, all these november 1st you must uh, remember november 1st was the is the karnataka day the red and yellow karnataka flags fly high so this is the red and yellow though it is not an officially declared but, but red and yellow karnataka flags fly high street corners blast off iconic kannada songs this year chief minister b s yedurappa declared that neither the token day nor month is good enough and a whole year instead will be dedicated to the promotion of kannada so the chief minister said no, just one day or a month will not be enough to develop uh, or you can say commemorate kannada but the whole year is focused on kannada that is what chief minister bsc adurappa said this year the spirit of rajyotsav is definitely muted the he- so this year it was muted it was not so much due to various reason first was the covid 19 second one was uh, to keep up with the science and now the digital wor- world clearly fight to declare kannada as a classical language in 2008 did little to achieve this connect so the reason why so much of uh, pomp and show did not happen in uh, the on the karnataka day reason was first was covid 19 which is all over the country and the world second was slowly the language is especially kannada is losing its charm it was declared a classical language in 2008 but it has not developed or not gone ahead after this even the kannada university established in 1991 is just 
shows just symbolic or it is only for literary folklore and cultural studies rather than human and natural sciences if language does not focus on human and natural sciences it does not grow severely damaged economy and two by elections so recently we had the whole economy collapsing and then by elections are coming up so all this the there was no show, uh, show and pomp for the karnataka day the calls for the claims commissioner in riot cases law against love jihad and for a branch of ni in bengaluru since it has become a terror terror hub so all these things were overshadowing the rajyotsav celebrations anti citizenship act protest farmers agitation state laws and central acts demand for reservations all this led to the rise of uh, various other factors rather than karnataka being the, the celebrations of kannada or karnataka state being into focus today gandhinagar sandalwood as a center of kannada film industry is ironically called is in disarray so the kannada film industry that is uh, also called as the gandhinagar sandalwood is in a lot of problem drug scandal you must have heard about the drug scandal in the kannada film industry kannada remains a beleaguered language in the state capital in bengaluru itself kannada is not spoken much bengaluru to which people from the entire country have flocked for job education and opportunity its infant its inferiorized status in everyday life stems from the long held belief that cosmopolitanism of the city has freed middle class migrants of any such obligation of learning the local language so so many people from outside has led to the local languages being affected bengaluru also must be the only city in the country where the local again largely working class takes pride in speaking several languages including those of most of its immigrants so there is a class divide now and this is happening not only with kannada but many of the country's language the karnataka rakshana vedike and the other kannada organizations and even opposition leaders have taken umbrage at the significant absence of karnataka flag at the official functions on november 1st to them this is a sign of federal uh, courtesies being violated it is better no more focus rather than kannada and uh, culture and federalism is on better jobs refurbished and reliable healthcare and improved primary education that states should take pride in so there is a debate on one side we have should we take pride in the culture language and our and other factors or on the healthcare primary education etc what the what many people believe or what the writer says you need to take a balance of the two rather than focusing on just one side so this is the debate that you need to focus on this is what how uh, we need to focus on the topic so this is all for the day remember this the art and science of asking question is source of all knowledge